Come gather round people wherever you roam, and admit that the waters around you have grown, and accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone, if your time to you is worth saving. And you better start swimming, or you'll sink like a stone, for the times they are a-changing. You probably recognize that ballad by Bob Dylan, and let's assume for the sake of this video that that is a protest song. And think to yourself, what would he be saying to us today? Would he be saying, the times they are changing, so just accept it? Or would he be saying, the times they are changing, and you need to be a change maker? Today we're talking about protest, resistance, change. We're going to talk about health, safety, and freedom. And we have a very special guest with us today. Nathan Wiley comes to us from Canada, and he comes from a country that is mandate oppressive and hysterical, and America isn't that far behind. So get a cup of coffee, a pen, a notebook. You just might want to take notes. I think you will enjoy this. <music> Welcome to Know and Grow. You can't live what you don't know. I'm Bonnie Wiley, wife, mother, follower of Jesus, called to ministry, doing what I love most. And one of the things I love most is having my children come to visit me. Nathan, we're so glad you're here today and joining me for this episode. He is the youngest of three. And Nathan, tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I'm, I consider myself an independent researcher. I've moved in and out of academia since I was a teenager when I first attended Montgomery County Community College. <laughs> uh, I think I was maybe 17 or 18 at the time, so for the better part of two decades. Yes. He, he did his senior year in high school at the same time he did his first year in college. Yeah, I studied philosophy. Um, my degree, my undergraduate degree is in philosophy and biblical studies at Geneva College. And then I traveled. I went to Japan for four years, mm -hmm. then South Korea. And then I joined a group called the Global Center for Advanced Studies, which took me to Slovenia. And then I got my master's degree in social and applied philosophy at Marquette. Mm -hmm. And now I'm in a PhD program at the University of Western Ontario in London. Some of my research interests and activities at the time are the ethics of revolutionary organization, uh, psychological warfare, propaganda and counter-propaganda. I'm also interested in psychology, crowd psychology, mm -hmm. and what's uh, uh, being talk discussed now as mass formation psychosis. Well, I want to come back to that so you can explain what that is a little bit later. So, Nathan, um, you felt comfortable getting the first two things that we're talking about today. <laughs> Tell us what happened after after the second one. The jabs, yes. I not, I not only felt comfortable, I felt like it was necessary. Um, although, when I got the second jab, uh, I, I'll never forget that moment. I'll never forget going in and sitting down and having second thoughts and thinking mm -hmm. maybe I should get up and leave. I'd really like to get up and leave. Mm -hmm. But the uh, panic that was induced in um, our population and the populations around the globe was so strong that uh, I remained <clears throat> convinced that this was uh, the best course of action. However, I had an adverse reaction to the second jab which was in my left arm and the reaction manifested in the left side of my face. It was numb when I opened my mouth. It was painful. I couldn't mm -hmm. even get a spoonful of soup in there without, uh -huh. the, without pain. And that continued for a few weeks. It happened about a week after the first jab. Mm -hmm. And to this day, there's still a, a lack of sensation, a sort of numbness in that part of my face. Mm -hmm. It's very uh, minor, but... Sometimes I can feel it, uh, I can sense it 
more strongly than at other times or not sense it. <laughs> um, okay. Wow. Well, thank you for sharing that. Now, so what until now seemed like a, a, a reasonable acceptance began to change for you. You began to have second thoughts about what you were seeing happening around you. Tell us more about that. Well, there were red flags um, from the very beginning. And one such flag was when my wife went in to get her second jab mm -hmm. prior to me getting mine. The, the military was there in fatigues and armed. This was um, at the Wisconsin, Wisconsin Center in downtown Milwaukee. Oh my goodness. And so that of course was suspicious. Why do we need sure. arms, military personnel? Um, there were other flags, for example, I, I noticed that on Netflix they had um, documentaries ready to go to reassure us that um, the vaccine process was underway. Mm -hmm. Bill Gates was a very public figure, and of mm -hmm. course Bill Gates is a highly suspicious individual, despite his efforts in the past 10 or 15 years to rebrand himself after uh, he was um, became a detested public figure for his monopolizing activities in tech. So those were all there, but <clears throat> there was an overriding concern that there was a pathogen racing through the global population mm -hmm. that could um, kill my parents, the woman I would uh, soon marry, Janelle, who has, um, who is especially vulnerable. So that was my overriding concern. How can I keep the people close to me safe? How can I keep my neighbors safe? And there was consistent messaging across all media platforms, including independent media platforms. And I've never followed the mainstream media. And that messaging was that we need to take certain steps to ensure that our neighbors are safe. And that's a very powerful message to someone who, to, to anyone who, uh, it's a natural human response. To and, and what you say, and especially to people who grew up in the church where love thy neighbor as thyself is a maxim. So I think sometimes Christians were um, especially, or, or people with that background were especially vulnerable to just accept that, yes, I must do that for my neighbor. Sure. And really just everyday people, too. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I remember in in the panic, not that I was panicking, but there was mm -hmm. just, there was a mass sort of fear that was setting in. Mm -hmm. Going to the grocery store, everyone's masked, and there was a palpable, though tacit sense of solidarity. People were especially friendly to one another. Mm -hmm. They were taking care to, to, and they were very generous and gentle. Mm -hmm. And it was, there, was a, there was a feeling of solidarity. One philosopher um, wrote a book that this is the moment. This is the, this is the time that the world will come together. And um, the pandemic will bring the world together and it will bring necessary reforms, maybe even revolution. And so this was, uh, this was a, a feeling uh, that was uh, present early mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, I remember when it was like two, two weeks to slow the spread. We were, we were in it. Well, well, sure, we're willing to sacrifice that. But it didn't take but a few more weeks and, and things just didn't seem right. They didn't seem right, but, you know, people are busy. And especially when something like this happens, and we have to go on lockdown, you start to you start to think about uh, stockpiling food, you start to think about all kinds yeah, especially of especially toilet paper, especially toilet <laughs> paper. Yeah. So you don't necessarily have the the time to raise the critical questions. And in an emergency situation, you're not going to be inclined to do so either. And in my mm -hmm. particular circumstance, I was trying to complete a degree that I invested mm -hmm. a lot in. And so mm -hmm. Uh, I wanted to make sure I was able to see that through. And as people who have been in the university know, it uh, takes a lot of time and energy to, mm -hmm. to do the work. So I, I, I put, on, um, put on the back burner 
and suppressed, I think, uh, subconsciously uh, the, the red flags that I was seeing and the questions that I, that I had. So um, then you graduated, and over the summer you had more time to investigate. What did you find when you began to investigate? That's right. Immediately after um, I graduated, um, this is what I turned my attention to. Mm-hmm. And <clears throat> I'm indebted to some investigative journalis- journalists, Whitney Webb at Unlimited Hangouts, James Corbett at the Corbett Report, who did an excellent documentary on Bill Gates. Check it out. And we can, um, the things that Nathan brings up, we can put links to in the description. So make sure you look below. And so it didn't take much time, really, to start to realize Mm -hmm. that something was amiss and that um, and that there were bigger things going on and that uh, the measures that were being taken. I I knew that lockdowns were devastating the economy. I knew Mm -hmm. that this was being used as an opportunity by those in power to consolidate more power Mm -hmm. by taking by transfer of wealth by closing small businesses as a initial step towards consolidating property. And mm-hmm. so I knew based on my research, my history as a researcher and the interest that I had, I knew that these sorts of things were taking place. But at the time I thought this is maybe just opportunistic, this is something called disaster capitalism, where <clears throat> anytime there's a good disaster, the capitalist don't want to let it go to waste. Yes, I was just listening to Glenn Beck, and he was talking about something similar. He was saying that he had a report where a high percentage of the purchases of um, land were not by private individuals, like buying, buying, going out to buy a home. This was, I think, the third quarter of 2021 that he was talking about. Instead, what they were were private investigator or investors, sorry, private investors buying up the land. And that goes right along with what you were just saying, Nathan. There's mm-hmm. something more sinister about about what's going on. Yes. And you know, a lot of people who talk about disaster capitalism talk about it in terms of opportunism. But for me, it seems clear that if disasters bring about such fantastic opportunities to accumulate more and more power, to seize, capture more and more power, then you're incentivized to create the disaster. And so Mm -hmm. I began to uh, speculate, along with journalists that I was following at the time, that this was an intentionally created disaster in order for there to be a further consolidation of power at the top of the pyramid. Mm. I've noticed that you were reading a book, um, The Real Anthony Fauci. Can you tell us about uh, the author and uh, what you've been discovering with him and maybe a little bit about the book? Everyone should check out Robert F. Kennedy Jr. and um, what he's doing right now with his website, childrenshealthdefense.org, and you should purchase and carefully read uh, the book he's written on the real Anthony Fauci. It's possibly the most important book of my lifetime, probably is the most important book of my lifetime. I endorsed it as such on Amazon. And really it speaks for itself. I I heard one um, person that I listened to, Catherine Austin Fitz, describe it as a cutting through the fog of war. So Mm -hmm. anyone who's out there who who knows something is amiss and who wants to dependable, well-researched information about it should take a look at that book, take a look at the the Defender, their publication at the Mm childrenshealthdefense.org and get a grounding in the reality and the facts mm-hmm. of what's happening with the uh, medical cartel, the medical pharmaceutical cartel, mm-hmm. which uh, Anthony Fauci is a, is a key player. And this goes back decades from my understanding that even back with um, AIDS, what, what, when, what we think of what was really was going on, what really was happening even with AIDS 
was different than what we were led to believe. Anthony Fauci had a big hand in some nefarious things with AIDS too, didn't he? That's true, yes. Uh, I don't know the details. I'm actually on that chapter right now in oh, the book. Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> but what's clear and what's clarified in, in the book is that this is nothing new. That there's been a process mm -hmm. going back decades of capture of public health institutions like the NIAID, the NIH, the CDC, and making cozy relationships and creating uh, a racketeering uh, a conspiracy, a racketeering conspiracy. L let me say, uh, creating creating a big pharma racket. Mm. And, you know, one of the, the main points that uh, Robert F. Kennedy Jr. points out is that Tony Fauci's position as the head of the NIH is to survey potential toxins in the environment to protect populations mm -hmm. against those toxins. And ever since he came to be the head of the NIH in 1984, there's been a steady decline in uh, public health because he's not doing what he's supposed to be doing there. Mm -hmm. Instead, he's using his position to um, to basically create a, a cartel of uh, cozy relationships with the big pharmaceutical companies and um, big tech. Big, well, a lot. Anything that you put big in front of there. It's, and it's big because it's bigger than health. I just was reading uh, something from about the United Nations having a new educational plan for for the world. You know, not just your 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 own state or school district deciding what you're going to study. But let me um, let me just read a little bit about it here. <clears throat> It's social justice, globalism, human rights, climate change, sustainability, and the common good. Now, at first glance, you would think there's some good, noble things there. But when I mentioned it to Nathan earlier today, he, uh, he understood it as something bigger than well-intentioned philanthropy and that kind of thing. Well, it, yeah, it all sounds great, and um, especially for people in academia, um, these are have long been concerns, mm -hmm. but they're Trojan horses. Uh, <clears throat> there's a lot of climate alarmism that's taking place right now, and you can see the efforts to continue to trigger panic in populations shifting from... Um, the panic of the pandemic mm -hmm. and what's called fear porn surrounding mm -hmm. the pandemic to creating fear porn around climate alarmism. And let me just inject here that I, you may have seen uh, Project Veritas uh, had an undercover person in CNN and they were saying that uh, as just like you said, as the pandemic fears aren't as strong as they need them to be to keep the public in line, the next thing they were going to do would be climate change. And that was like, an, that was, the person didn't know they were being uh, recorded. And that was from C CNN. So yes, exactly. That is exactly what's happening. And somebody who's been looking into this and talking about it for some time is Corey Morningstar. I can't remember the name of her website, but mm -hmm. um, she talks about the, the role of the climate emergency in this larger um, totalitarian takeover uh, and the decimation of democracies or across the world and the implementation of authoritarian measures and controls that will uh, eviscerate our freedoms and the way that Greta Thunberg and other climate activists even people in politics that I used to support are um, uh, involved in an orchestrated um, 
propaganda campaign to induce panic as a cover for implementing emergency measures. State of exception, where we live in a state of exception. We live in a state of exception in the United States since 9-11. And mm -hmm. in those sta state of exceptions, the state is invested with uh, powers beyond its constitutional, ordinary constitutional mm -hmm. rights. Mm -hmm. And of course, those in power have an incentive to keep that state of exception going. Mm -hmm. And so make no mistake, that will continue until we stop it. And the thing that we have to do to stop it is not uh, allow the panic to uh, trigger fear and to uh, exercise our human rights and to resist, 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 resist. Can I ask you, Nathan, um, f from my experience, the, um, the people that are that they come against are the unvaccinated and they look at anybody who is unvaccinated as like um, almost like a lower class person like they just they don't follow the science they don't know what they're talking about but you're you're in a PhD program in one of the top 10 universities of Canada so it's not just um, your everyday rural person like mom and dad. Tell us more about who you're coming across that's, well, you already have been bringing some up, but tell us about that antagonism uh, towards, I think you've called it medical apartheid, haven't you? Yeah, that's a term that's used, medical apartheid. The unvaccinated is a um, designation that's part of a psychological warfare campaign we've seen this tactic used before we've seen racialization create antagonisms that have become deeply rooted and we're currently witnessing a new antagonism being formed namely the antagonism uh, against what is designated as the unvaccinated that's part of there's a conflation there are two conflations that have been consistent across mainstream media messaging. The first conflation is that uh, those who are unvaccinated are only and exclusively, say, Trump supporters, alt-right, uh, fascists is a further conflation. They, they, they mm -hmm. have painted the entire uh, Trump base, th those who supported Trump, as fascists. I've seen articles coming out of um, think tanks and uh, research centers that, that do this uh, dubiously. Uh, mm -hmm. there, are, there are good researchers out there who dismantle this conflation. That's been a consistent conflation that those who are hesitant about the so-called vaccines are just a bunch of idiot mm -hmm. Trump supporters. This is how they're viewed. This is not my opinion. Who, um, who don't believe in science, who are racist and mis misogynist. This is words that came out of Justin Trudeau's mouth just a few months ago. Um, <clears throat> that's not true at all. In uh, the U.S., the main groups that are vaccine hesitant are the uh, black population, mm -hmm. owing to mm -hmm. history. That's right. And... The PhDs, like myself, people who are uh, have PhDs or are researching these things. So you had a second conflation you said you wanted to talk about, right? Second conflation, I mean, there are many conflations, but so I'll just say another conflation mm -hmm. is the conflation of science with consensus, which is absurd. I even had one professor of mine critique uh, a source that I used in a paper, that source was from someone who belongs to the resistance, and the professor simply dismissed it as not belonging to the scientific consensus. Well, hmm. science does not operate on consensus, it's quite the opposite. Science thrives on dissensus, and I just read this uh, about an hour ago from Bobby Kennedy's book, chapter 5, 
page 178, he gets it, uh, he gets it right. He says that politics and power dictate what's called scientific consensus rather than empiricism, critical thinking, or the established steps of the scientific method. He continues, while consensus may be an admirable political objective, it is the enemy of science and truth. The term settled science is an oxymoron. The admonishment that we should trust the experts is a trope of authoritarianism. Science is disruptive, irreverent, dynamic, rebellious, and democratic. I'll just stop there. Um, he goes on to say it involves doubt, skepticism, questioning, and dissent as fertilizers. And this is how education works. This is how higher education is supposed to work, but it is completely atrophied. And I'm supposed to be in a top 10 university in Canada, but let me tell you that there's very little critical thinking going on right now mm -hmm. in this atrophied uh, system, which is, uh, I've always been a critic of academia, but uh, in the past 18 months, two years, it's really shown its colors as um, as totally having lost sight of its mandate. Does that have something to do with the, you mentioned when we first started, mass psychosis, something around? Mass formation psychosis. And this is a term that I learned from Dr. Matthias Desmet, who is a Belgium psychiatrist, also mm -hmm. trained in st uh, statistics. And he's uh, offered a diagnosis of what we're currently experiencing as uh, mass formation psychosis. So I looked into mass formation mm -hmm. psychosis, and in particular, Dr. D uh, Desmond mentioned the, a book by Gustave Le Bon. Gustave Le Bon was a French social psychologist, considered the grandfather or father of social psychology. He wrote a book in 1895 called The Crowd, A Study of the Popular Mind, which was highly influential in uh, imperial military thought in Europe and the United States. It was taken up, Gustav Le Bon was read by Hitler, Mussolini, and many others, and his theories were highly influential in, uh, in uh, the mili military circles. There's a great article by uh, Joseph Bendersky titled Panic the Impact of Le Bon's Crowd Psychology on U.S. Military Thought, published in the Journal of the History of the Behavioral Sciences in 2007. We can maybe link that for anyone who might be interested. Okay. But here's what Le Bon says. Le Bon is interested in how to manipulate crowds. So he believes that crowd formation is an unconscious phenomenon. And he raises the question, he's the first to do so, about how unconscious uh, processes can be manipulated. And the way this is taken up in the military is with a twofold concern. First, how can we create um, strong, cohesive groups? Like um, you want a, a, an army, right, that won't panic. How can we cultivate morale in the, in the different military divisions such that when faced with a uh, deadly situation, they'll be willing to sacrifice their lives and they'll be able to do, then they'll do so without uh, panicking. The other concern, which is more interesting for the moment that we're in, is how they can trigger panic in populations. Trigger. Trigger. Yes. Purposely. Purposely trigger. There's all kinds of research done in military literature about um, social engineering, psychological warfare, triggering panic, and controlling crowds. This is a preoccupation uh, of elites, going back at least as far back as Gustave Le Bon, um, certainly before him, but it became a science with Le Bon's work. And that science has been refined through the First and Second World Wars, mm. and it's being implemented today worldwide. So mm. they're concerned with how to create a situation where... Um, the masses are fearful and they're subject to hypnosis, suggestibility. Mm -hmm. Le Bon identifies characteristics of crowd like irritability, how they can be deployed um, to, uh, you know, how they can be essentially manipulated. And that's what we're seeing mm -hmm. today. We're seeing panic induced in the population and then 
And then that gives way to a mechanisms of control that people who research this stuff know how to exploit using propaganda. That is amazing. And we're getting close to winding it up here, but um, you'll be returning to the classroom soon. And I know you got an email today that caused some concern for you, and you foresee you foresee what might be happening as you return and what you might be up against and what you, some decision, major decisions you might have to make. And because, because your university is part of this mess. Not that everybody is, um, but you know, there's tremendous pressure on people not to speak up to self-censor because everything's at stake. They're bribing us with our livelihoods. We're being bribed mm -hmm. with our uh, with everything, basically. So it's very difficult for people to resist un under such pressure. And I mean, to get accepted into a major university's PhD program means they're paying for your education, and they even give you a stipend, even though it might be not that that big. But everything helps. So for a student to come against that means they might lose all of that, which is very, very hard to get. It's not easy to get in. And you also had a professor. Or a um, professor. They'll have the, you'll get pushed out if you speak up. You tell get pushed us, out of tell academia. Tell us about Julie. You have your reputation completely tarnished. Mm -hmm. This has happened with many scientists around the world who have, mm -hmm. like, uh, Robert Malone comes to mind, Peter McCulloch. Uh, and many, many others who have uh, had their reputations. It's a very um, accomplished, top-tier scientist mm -hmm. of the highest caliber. All of a sudden, now all the Wikipedia articles say they're anti-vaxxers and conspiracy theorists. Mm -hmm. Well, go look up their videos and you'll get a good grounding in reality. Mm -hmm. You mentioned uh, one Western professor of philosophy, mm -hmm. ethics is her specialization, who refused to get vaccinated and she was pushed out and has since become a public voice for Canadian uh, Canada COVID Care Alliance, I think is the name of the organization. And she speaks powerfully to, uh, to these issues as well. Similarly with me, I've begun to, to speak out and I'm starting to get pushback. But the big pushback that we're all going to, the big obstacle that we're all going to likely run into is this question of getting on the booster treadmill. You either get on the booster treadmill or you're going to get locked out of society. This has already happened in Canada in August 2021. Mandates were imposed so that if you're not vaccinated, you can't enter public spaces. Um, you can't go to restaurants and sit down, cafes, sit down and, and eat. Meanwhile, those who are vaccinated go in with their masks on. When they sit down, <clears throat> they take their mask off, sit side by side, and often complaining about how the unvaccinated are making them are are, are uh, threatening their threatening their lives. And I've heard it articulated by even a professor of mine who said that it's within their right of self defense to coerce people who haven't gotten the jabs into getting them because that's an act on their part of protecting themselves despite well-documented studies hundreds or not maybe not hundreds but there might be hundreds at this point i don't know but there are numerous studies that uh, show that vaccination so-called does not protect against transmissibility. It doesn't even, um, the other, other claims that it reduces hospitalization or severity of the, um, the um, infection are also proving to be uh, dubious. So the product doesn't work, but still this narrative continues and we, intensifies. We just heard from our own Supreme Court, uh, was it Friday, I think, um, or Monday, Friday, However, the, the one lady, one justice, um, giving fat, well, facts that were untrue. Is, is there any such thing as an untrue fact? I guess that's an oxymoron. It's right? an oxymoron. Uh, yeah, she, she was saying things that are absolutely not even true. And so even in our Supreme Court, uh, so... This is psychological warfare that's mm -hmm. being conducted uh, on populations worldwide. It's a persistence. It's achieved through repetition. 
people who are mm-hmm. part of the mass formation psychosis right now, it's not their fault. They are victims. And it's important to keep that in mind because mm-hmm. we have to exercise compassion towards those who have been victimized through this repetitive messaging that triggers primitive responses in human biological systems. Mm -hmm. And this is also induced through wearing masks. When you you see people, you can't see their faces or they're wearing them, it uh, triggers the lizard brain and it tells, which says where I'm in a hazardous environment. And so people Mm -hmm. are walking around in fear. How do we find our part to help in all of this? Non-compliance. Okay. Do not comply. When we put the mask on and we comply, they win. Every fight, fights are, are, are small, but there, we have to exercise our right and our, our autonomy, our own critical thinking skills. Mm-hmm. We cannot outsource we're being invited to outsource all our critical thinking to the experts. Mm-hmm. The whole advent of uh, big tech and social media invites us to continue outsourcing our memories and our critical thinking skills. We have to take those human qualities back. We have to um, exercise our freedoms, refuse to comply, and we have to, under a tyranny, Aristotle says that the marks of a tyranny are that social bonds begin are ruptured. And we're, we're experiencing that now. We're being isolated. We're being put on lockdown. Um, and we have to take care to nurture our human bonds. Go to church if you're, uh, if you're a practicer, practitioner of any kind of faith. Be with people. If mandates are imposed, and they will be, don't comply. But we have to organize because if we individually don't comply then we can be individually punished and defeated Mm -hmm. so we must organize non-compliant actions everywhere and um, that's why i've been looking into the ethics of revolutionary organization and once i'm pushed out of western university which is probably going to happen at the end of the month that's what i'm anticipating that boosters will be mandated i'll fight them i will file legal proceedings through Canadian COVID Care Alliance and the organizations that are fighting this there. But my expectation is that this is going to intensify, that there'll be further attacks, and that people have got to realize that we are not living in normal circumstances and we are Mm -hmm. not going to return to normal until we take it back. And that means organizing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you, Nathan. This has definitely been an eye opener and we will have him back. We'll we'll find a way when he is in Canada to um, have an interview uh, long distance. We'll do that. And thank you so much. This has been very helpful. Very, very helpful. Forward to victory. We shall conquer. <laughs> okay, so let's look at all this in light of um, God's hatred of evil and his, his love and provision for freedom. And let's just say a prayer right now. Lord, we just thank you, Father, that you care about us. You care about our country. Lord, you don't just care about America. You care about every single nation in the world. And we pray a blessing upon every nation. We pray, Father, that you would help individuals within nations to know what to do, to be brave, to be bold, and to stand up. And Father, help us to know where we can, um, organ- how we can organize, how we can gather together and, and, and grow in strength, Father. And Father, we just pray that you'll guide us and direct us in all of this. And Father, look with mercy upon this world. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thanks for joining me. It's Know and Grow. You can't live what you don't know. Until next time, bye-bye, and thanks again, Nathan. Thank you very much.